less than 1% of Alzheimer's is caused by genes. You can predict a country's murder rate, homicide, depression, um, simply by knowing <laughs> their marine food consumption. The, the most promising treatment for dementia, inexpensive, uh, just didn't get covered, just ignored. Why? You've got a 10 p a day pill here, or you've got a 50 to 100,000 pound drug treatment here. This is a solutions event. This is what's happening. After five successful events in North America, the Freedom Cell Network is partnering with Free Humanity to bring the People's Reset to Bath, UK. The technocrats at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum are now hosting the Summit of the Future in New York City in September 2024. Join us in September for the People's Reset UK, our summit for our future. Over three days, we will gather in community, celebrating our victories and successes, whilst continuing to highlight solutions under five holistic themes. Liberate your mind, body, and spirit. Permaculture and food independence. Building parallel networks empowering technology and building free and conscious communities 24 top-notch speakers including neil oliver charles dowding dan aston gregory nigel hallett john and rebecca bush and many more we'll also be hosting the people's reset concert featuring international artist dub fx as well as presence 33 and more talented performers to come join us for the people's reset uk Visit thegreaterreset.org to learn more and to get your ticket today. Is the world going mad or, or are we having a mental health meltdown? Today, we're going to be talking about brain health. I'm joined by Patrick Holford. Returning for the second time, we'll talk more about his first appearance in a moment. But he's got over 40 years experience in natural health, nutritional health, and is the author of over 40 books on the topic. He's written extensively on the biochemistry of mental health and has cutting edge research into the treatment of certain mental illnesses and nutritional therapies. He's a founder of the Institute for Optimum Nutrition, where he's worked on nutritional approaches to clinical depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, and eating disorders. And he's the co-founder of the charity Food for the Brain Foundation and director of the Brain Bio Center, both organizations applying a nutrition-first approach to mental health. Now, I referenced our very first interview. We met during the course of the pandemic, and we were discussing the impact of vitamin C on the COVID uh, situation and presenting simply clinical information that was available at the time and referencing past information that, that showed potential efficacy. And for that crime, we were, <laughs> we were censored and Patrick was the very first guest that I had that was censored, one of several during the course of the pandemic chapter. So um, whilst I wanna focus on brain health today, Patrick, this is, the, the, and I'm very looking forward to talking about the subject. But before we get into that, I do wanna to touch on how we were, to, uh, we were censored for simply talking about vitamin C. And you know, more, more particularly, how you found yourself operating in such an environment over the last few years, where it does seem there, there is some more of a wider attack on natural approaches to prevention. How, how has it been for you over the last few years? Well, it's sort of the, the same as ever, but you know, with resistance. And if you've been in the field of nutrition and health as long as I have, what you, what you kind of get to realize is that if there happens to be a pill, um, that would compete with major drug markets, um, then you're going to run into trouble. It's okay talking about a well-balanced diet, exercise, not smoking, and other such things. But, you know, the extraordinary thing was vit vitamin C. I mean, there we were writing a paper in the leading nutrition journal, Nutrients, with top professors from around the world, all very, very clear evidence, which the Chinese jumped on. Uh, it actually became mandated policy to use high doses of vitamin C in COVID. Uh, but somehow that was just kept out of the agenda. And if you ask me so honestly why, I would say because if the true power of vitamin C were acknowledged, uh, it would wipe out a number of medications, you know, like the, you know, the immune drugs that were developed were not as effective as vitamin C. And Funny enough, as we move into the so whole area of mental health, we have a very, very similar thing happening. And by the way, uh, since we spoke, we, we raised the money to do the first ever trial or study of vitamin C in care homes. 
Because extraordinarily, if you look at the evidence, in the UK, every other year, they do a, a survey called the uh, National Diet Nutrition Survey. Um, they look at a cross-section of the population. They exclude anyone in care homes. So we just don't know. And the only study I could find in 1992 said that about half of people in care homes had scurvy level of vitamin C. So we set up a trial uh, with top professors, with NHS Scotland, actually, uh, with the Roa Institute, the University of Aberdeen, uh, top professors got ethics approval to actually look at vitamin C in care homes. And we raised all the money. And literally, just as we were about to start, it was cancelled. Of course. You know? Classic. And two weeks ago, we saw a very, very good study running on ketogenic diets and schizophrenia, University of uh, Maryland, cancelled. So, yeah, it's a bit worrying. And then um, a couple of weeks ago, we have uh, what's called the Lancet Commission. It's a sort of major authoritative review of uh, ways to prevent dementia. And uh, it, you know, in many respects, is quite a good report. And it says that 45% of dementia is preventable. Uh, but two of the hardest hitting subjects, and that is, is B vitamins, which I want to talk about, the lower, something called homocysteine in the blood, and omega-3, very easily changed. Uh, and according to Chinese research, literally the most promising treatment for dementia, inexpensive, uh, just didn't get covered, just ignored. And it wasn't just ignored uh, because we sent all the papers because the 2017 edition ignored it and the 2020 edition ignored it. And now, so in other words, it, it's not just sort of forgotten about, it's purposefully ignoring the science. Why? Probably the same thing. You've got a 10 p a day pill here, or you've got a 50 to 100,000 pound drug treatment here, annual cost of these new anti-amyloid drugs. So there is this deep distrust within medicine of any nutrient uh, that might be required uh, in the form of a supplement, e.g. beyond what you can eat. So mm, yeah. same as usual. That's the block. You know, my son is nearly three years old and, you know, is learning the alphabet. And it seems like the first few letters of the alphabet are key, A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, when you look at um, vitamin D as another variable, you know, it's, it, yeah. it, you know, after COVID, you know, there's studies done in, in similar care home situations. They say, oh, there was a the, the deficiency in vitamin D was a particular problem, of course, because you were locking your residents into their homes, preventing them from actually getting, and this is even in Spain, which has got, a, you know, a higher propensity to have a, a, a um sunlight but of course vitamin d is a conversation you couldn't have during the time vitamin c was a conversation we couldn't have during the time zuckerberg has now come out saying that there was pressure from the american government to suppress certain information keto you mentioned the ketogenic diet that, mm. that's basically being eradicated as a subject by youtube at the moment you know whether that's from external pressures or whether they're making their own um, content moderation decisions it, so all of these things stack up as frightening um, uh, attack and, uh, on our kind of uh, our ability to educate ourselves on the things that could truly transform our health. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that stands out for me, the link to this, and you know, a friend of mine said, you know, what, what, why is the FDA called the FDA, and you know, what, why is food and drugs in the same <laughs> sentence? Um, uh, because when I when I hear what you're saying and what other people are saying, you know, these nutritional deficiencies appear to be a, a major uh, uh, function, whether it's our physical health, our mental health, our, our emotional health these deficiencies are creating huge problems in society, yet we're not addressing the root cause. We're just looking for other forms of pills that can be manufactured in the pharmaceutical industry to be the quick fix to these things that actually probably have a much more fundamental solution. Well, you're, you're right. And if you, the, the point is, if you actually step a long way back and you ask, how did we become human? Um, you know, six and a half million years ago, uh, we split from chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas. Their brain size stays exactly the same. Um, ours grew and grew and grew and grew until we get to, you know, a chimp's brain is maybe 360 grams or 360 cc. Ours is 1700 cc. And do you know what I recently realized? Because I, I've represented and well founded the concept of optimum nutrition, which is very similar to functional medicine uh, or orthomolecular medicine, which is what my 
great teachers, Dr. Linus Pauling, the uh, twice Nobel Prize winner, 48 PhDs, called it. It was Darwin. Darwin actually said there are two forces driving evolution. One is the conditions of existence, and the second is natural selection. And of those two, he said in every single thing he wrote, the conditions of existence are more important. Let me explain this. What happens is something changes. I don't know, a meteor strikes, the weather pattern changes, you know, global warming, whatever it is, the conditions of existence change. As a consequence, certain um, species do better than others. Also. So that's natural selection kicking in. Um, I was in London the other day watching a fox playing in the garden. Now, you don't get badgers in London. So conditions of existence of urbanization is good for foxes, bad for badgers. So our genes are 1% different, you know, to that of a chimpanzee or gorilla. So it had to be a change in the conditions of existence. And one of the things we absolutely know is you could not have built a bigger brain without more omega-3s, um, more what are called phospholipids, um, also in fish and eggs, and more B vitamins, particularly B12, which is also in, in fish. So in other words, what, what we now know is that our ancestors uh, became waterside apes. In other words, we exploited wetlands, swamplands, rivers. We became upright, wading in water. We got manual dexterity, opening shells. And the real clincher, which is what uh, Sir David Attenborough alluded to on a TV series, he said, when a baby's born, they have this waxy waterproof layer called the vernix. He said, I've never seen this in any land-based mammal. I wonder if it occurs in the sea mammals. And these are the animals that move from the, sea, from the land to the ocean, like a seal. And the answer is yes. Marine mammals have a vernix. Humans have a vernix. No land-based mammals do. So I'm sort of moving quite fast. Now, down the road from where I live in Wales, the Gower Peninsula, they discover a 40,000-year-old um, human remain. And when they analyzed, this is, it was called Paviland Woman because it had all this jewelry made of shells. It turned out it was a man, Paviland Man. And uh, when they analyzed the diet, almost a quarter of their diet was seafood, was marine food. So if I just say, let's assume they were having twice the exercise, you know, that I do, hunter, gatherer, et cetera, et cetera. If I wanted to get the amount of omega-3, B vitamins, phospholipids, minerals, that my ancestors were getting during the phase that led to our big brains, what would I need to eat? <laughs> In this context, half of my diet would have to be seafood. So when we look at things like vitamin D, which is very rich in seafood too, and of course, if you're living outdoors, you're getting all the vitamin D. If you just say, what would our ancestors have got? And by the way, a very important point, is a human brain size has shrunk by 20% in the last 30,000 years. So we I went up gonna, and up I thought you were going to say since COVID. <laughs> no, no, that's true. I mean, no, <laughs> yes. but we are yeah. losing IQ. Yeah. Uh, we, our IQ is going down about 7% a generation. Um, we are losing brain size. And ultimately, it has to be the conditions of existence. So How I've got say a couple of uh, questions. I want to probe on this a little bit then. So. Um, for those that my brain is going to different directions, but towards the same end. So for those who lived in kind of wider land masses that didn't have access to, you know, they were, they were in living in inland congregations and, and didn't have the same access to seafood. Is there evidence to suggest that they had slower brain development? And, and was it when, you know, trade started to materialize and we're bringing uh, ocean life into, into greater what's the link here is is there a seafood is the wrong word it should be marine food because marine of food. course you can't exist if you're not next to water right of course yes so it's along the river's edge and the point is our so rivers... things like algae etc would be included you know spirulina's got a lot of benefits yeah they let me just touch on that in, in just a minute but the, the point is that our rivers and our coasts um and our estuaries were pumping with marine food okay and shells i mean just just so much i mean i know this is the sea not the river but i was recently in bantry in cork in you know in in south uh southwest ireland and they said uh, and the lady there hannah who was my host said when we grew up you know you just threw a line in and out popped the mackerel i mean there was so much mackerel 
It's just full. And the rivers, you know, were full of fish, eels and mussels and other such things. So, it does, you know, you might appear not to be close to the sea, but you have to be close to water to exist. Now, if you step back a bit and, and look at WHO data, um, what you see is that you can predict a country's murder rate, homicide, depression, um, simply by knowing <laughs> their marine food consumption. Wow. Right? So in other words, coastal people generally have better mood, less dementia, and so on, and inland people generally have more. Now, the problem with algae, and algae is great because, of course, you know, it's omega-3 starts off um, with algae, um, and then, you know, little fish eat algae and big fish eat little fish, and you end up with the most powerful omega-3, which is called DHA. DHA is what builds your brain. Now, the problem with spirulina, and actually I found this out by sort of interesting coincidence, because it apparently contains B12. And uh, so we fed it to people who were B12 deficient, pernicious anemia, and they didn't get better. And, and actually, the, the, the spirulina, as an example, um, contains an analog of B12 that doesn't work. So it's not humanly functional B12. But some um, of these uh, algae do contain actual B12, but it's actually from contamination. <laughs> so in the natural world, um, and of course I live on a farm and I eat as many plants and vegetables and all the rest of it, and there is no B12 in a vegetable. The only B12 that exists in a vegetable is effectively in a bacteria or a fungi or a living thing that might be on it. So I'm not very good at washing all my vegetables because actually I, I want some of that stuff. So, you know, like truffles apparently have some B12, but it, it's mainly that they're a bit dirty. So, <laughs> okay. so there is this interesting thing um, that, oh, and a study in India, a really good study, because they looked at vegans uh, who did not seem to have as much B12 deficiency, that is pernicious anemia, than Western vegans, and they wondered why. And uh, they analyzed their diet, which had a lot of lentils, beans, and so on. And they found the odd weevil or two um, hidden in the lentils and the beans. So a little insect, <laughs> now and again, so sort of less dirty food, or a bit more dirty food, can actually give you B12, but it is not present in an actual vegetable. Wow, okay. You know, so. Let's circle back a bit then. So you referenced the Lancet study, which, which talked mm. about methods of prevention. You, we, we, we were looking at another Lancet study prior to this conversation, which indicated some kind of vast mm -hmm. and alarming data showing that, you know, 43% of the world's population is suffering from some form of neurological condition mm. and that the neurological conditions themselves are responsible for 443 million years of healthy life lost due to uh, mental health yeah. illness, disabilities, premature death. Um, making it a top contributor to the global disease burden, ahead of cardiovascular disease. Oh, so it's way ahead. Yeah, I mean, this Lancet Neurology study in April, 3.4 billion people in the world have disability due to brain neurological mental health conditions, which ranges from dementia uh, to autism. So in terms of cost, because this has been, we've had quite a few analyses on these, the cost, for example, of, of, um, of, of brain disorders exceeds all of cancer and all of heart disease combined. So brain health is simply, you know, the, the biggest issue. And even if you just focus in on dementia, which we've spent a lot of time looking at, it's number one cause of death. The number one cause of death has been since 2022. It's by far the biggest healthcare cost. Um, and, you know, it is actually preventable. So if you step back to that evolutionary view, we have created a way of living that is so far away from that which created us. We have moved so far away from our wild natural food environment, not, not just the food environment, the physical environment in terms of exercise and everything else. And it's, it's creating this sort of perfect storm of effects. And surprise, surprise, it's hitting our brain. It also hits our heart and our liver and various other places. But it's unquestionably hitting our brain. And the real worry now is we have... Um, one in six children uh, require special educational needs. 
one in six children are classified as neurodivergent. It's not the same as neurodiverse. We're all neurodiverse, uh, neurodivergent. Uh, autism rates have, you know, doubled in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years. So we, we've got, I mean, special needs schools are just full and overflowing. I mean, there's a real crisis in kids. The Children's Society have reported a tripling in referrals for mental health conditions in children. Um, the Daily Mail actually reported that, uh, was it uh, over a million teenagers being prescribed antidepressants? Uh, the, you know, and the, it was the European um, Federation of Neuroscience Societies said we have a brain health emergency. What do you think is driving this then, Patrick? You know, I, you know, it's, for me, it's been very hard to kind of pinpoint specific factors. I, I can see a, a number of potential causal factors. I think what's the, your view? The best way of getting an overview on all of this um, is to understand three fundamental processes. This is a systems-based way of thinking. And the issue is our pharmacological age doesn't really like systems-based. It's very reductionist. Is there one drug that can treat one condition? Now, from a systems-based approach, you've got the structure of your brain. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll throw in a few things that we can bounce off. The actual neuron brain cell, the, the membrane of it, is made by binding those omega-3s to phospholipids, which I mentioned earlier, both found in marine food, phospholipids also names. The process is done by B vitamins. So you've got to have B vitamins, you've got to have omega-3, and you've got to have phospholipids. That's structure. And a lack of any one of those, for example, can promote dementia massively. Second is function. In order for a brain cell to work, or any cell, you need fuel. Uh, and the fuel is either glucose, as in carbohydrate, or ketones, which we make from fat. But um, Here's an irony that the more glucose, the more sugar, the more refined food, the more ultra processed food you eat, the more you become unable to deliver the glucose into the brain. It's called insulin resistance. So the irony is eating too much sugar leads to an inability to get sugar into brain cells. So you get brain fog and you can't think straight. You can't remember. And then you crave sugar because your brain neuron is saying, I'm starved of fuel. Now, by the way, when you get fuel you, and you then burn it, you make exhaust fumes, which are oxidants. So that is why the more fruit and veg, the, the lower your risk for these conditions. It's why if you smoke or you're in a polluted environment, the greater the risk uh, as well. So, you know, we've done structure, we've done function, and then you have utilization because actually you've got to use it. So we know that, you know, having a really boring job massively increases risk for dementia. Uh, you know, we know watching too much mindless television, you know, does the same thing. So you've got to use it. If you get cataracts, you have a greater risk. But if you have cataract surgery, you have less risk. If you have hearing loss, you have greater risk. If you have hearing aids, you have less risk. In other words, you need the stimulation. If you're lonely and have very little social interaction, you have more risk. So I think it's the combination of structure, function, and utilization. If we have created a world where we are isolated, and we do not have enough interaction and enough learning. Um, we need, you know, retiring, for example, can almost double a person's risk for dementia if they retire uh, at the age of 61 compared to after 66. I'm 66. I've just taken up paragliding. I've got my paraglider license. My wife just bought me a base and, a, and an amp. So I got to learn that. So, you know, you got to use your mind. So if you're using your mind and eating the right foods, you've got good structure and the right fuel then these things don't occur. So I think that's our, you know, that's our sort of perfect storm that we have created. And of course, you know, things like, you know, digital, social media, et cetera, you know, can be a blessing and a curse. Uh, you know, it depends exactly how you are using it. Um, and I was just speaking to a couple of parents in the schools their kids go to, they, they ban mobile phones you know, up to a certain age. And if you have one, it gets confiscated. And uh, they said the noise level has really gone up in the dining room. In other words, kids are talking to each other. 
Yes, of course. Socialization and again. Yep. Heads exactly. are up. It's a bit like our conversation. You know, there's nothing more challenging than having a conversation with somebody who may disagree with you or ask you an awkward question or do this, whatever. The whole banter really, you know, engages the mind. Um, so it's that combo. Yes. Would would you? But is there is there a correlation between the increased prevalence of digital technology and the impact on our brain health? Because on one you know, for, for myself, I think about you know, technology has become a great tool for my work. But also, I'm someone who has a relentless curiosity, a restless curiosity. I love learning. I'm absolutely addicted to it. So digital technology put, puts the world's information at my fingertips you know so I'm, I'm i'm using it to to learn and learn and learn and learn but i'm wondering you know do i almost become overactive in doing that like is that if i overtrain physically i could burn out my body you know is is our is our whether we whether we're using it healthily to to, to learn or unhealthily just just to you know scroll and scroll and scroll is is that is that a function that could be causing us some sort of deterioration in our mental functioning i think it depends exactly you know if you're learning you know, it's stimulating your mind. Um, if you're just looking at endless TikTok videos, <laughs> do nothing, and lying there on the sofa, you know, it's not really stimulating. And if the effect of that is less actual challenging, you know, social interactions and not getting up and exercising and so on. So I don't think digital technology is, um, you know, is, is the right title. It's, it's, it's very, very, you know, specifically how it's used. And the other issue there, which is, and by the way, every, it's quite nice because we've got a lot of research on Alzheimer's, which by the way, is a preventable disease. Less than 1% of Alzheimer's is caused by genes. This is well established, less than 1%. You do not need to lose your mind. Uh, I have worked with so many great scientists in their 90s who are pumping, you know, their brains are fully functional. Um, you do not need to lose your mind. That is a myth that this is a function of the aging process that you naturally, you know, um, need to get. Is, is that the same with dementia? Because I think Alzheimer's and dementia yeah. are kind of two of the most feared. You know, people have almost associated them with natural parts of the kind of aging process or, or genetic. You know, these yeah, things. That, these. It's wrong. They're, they're normal. Just to understand what happens is that if you start to, you know, lose your memory as such, your doctor. I mean, this doesn't happen, uh, should refer you to a memory clinic where they do a cognitive function test. This is a proper validated test. And the amazing thing is on a cognitive function test, we can pick up subtle changes 40 years before a diagnosis. And uh, um, so that's that. Now, of all of the dementias, about two thirds is Alzheimer's. But Alzheimer's is a disease in the same way that diabetes is a disease. And it involves the shrinkage of a particular central area of the brain called the medial temporal lobe. So you cannot be diagnosed with Alzheimer's from a cognitive function test. You have to have a brain scan that shows shrinkage. So those are really the two hallmarks, loss of cognitive function and shrinking brain. And is there evidence, Patrick, that this is now happening younger? You know, I, I heard that Alzheimer's, we're seeing evidence of Alzheimer's setting in in, in, in younger age groups. Is that is The that... youngest age of, an, and remember, 1% or less than 1% is caused by genes. There are two genes called AMP and presenilin, which if you happen to have them in your family, you are likely to get, you will get early onset Alzheimer's. And can you test for those? Is, is that something that you can be can tested? Test yeah. and, and, and for many people, they get worried because they're, parent has had alzheimer's they think oh it's in my genes i'm gonna get it um this early onset is usually happening in the 50s or 60s not in the 70s 80s or 90s so if your parents started to get dementia in the 80s it's very unlikely that this caused it now the youngest age of a non-genetic alzheimer's diagnosis is age 19. wow my goodness and one of the extraordinary things is we um that is the charity food for the brain or what actually uh, the story is quite good because back in i wrote a book about this thing called homocysteine which you may never have heard of and uh but the evidence on it was so amazing that the subtitle was the biggest breakthrough medical breakthrough of the century and i stand by that and that book was in 2003 and that led me to um meet some amazing scientists who developed understood 
uh, homocysteine. And one of them was uh, the um, second in charge of Oxford Medical School, Professor of Pharmacology, David Smith. And he had found high levels of homocysteine in the brains of people with Alzheimer's and decided to do a proper randomized placebo controlled trial with several hundred people diagnosed with pre-dementia, measuring their homocysteine and giving them either B vitamins, and I'll explain which ones in, in a minute, or placebo. And the first thing they found was the higher the level of homocysteine, the greater was the rate of brain shrinkage over a year. So they're measuring brain shrinkage, which is a hallmark of Alzheimer's. And those, um, and then he gave the B vitamins, and he got more than a halving in the rate of brain shrinkage. It's a massive effect. And then I'll throw in an extra piece here, because a, a few years later, he realized the omega-3s needed to build the brain. He didn't give omega-3, but he went back to the original blood samples. And he found um, that those with in the highest third for omega-3, e.g. sufficient in omega-3, had 73% less shrinkage of the brain. And at the end of a year, one third had no clinical dementia rating at all. In other words, would no longer be diagnosed with dementia. Given a 10 p a day B vitamin, no longer diagnosable with dementia, a reduced rate of brain shrinkage down to that that you find in normal, healthy older people. And then just a few, uh, you know, a week or so ago, we saw that this anti-amyloid drug uh, treatment, which is going to cost 50 to 100,000 pounds a year, got a license. Uh, but the NHS are not allowed to prescribe it because it's not effective. And that drug got 20% more increased rate of brain shrinkage, one third the clinical effect of the B vitamins. So you've got a 10 a day B vitamin that is three times as effective, slows the rate of brain shrinkage by up to 73%, or a 50 to 100 grand a year drug, uh, which has already killed some people in the trial, uh, which causes about a quarter to have brain bleeding or swelling, and actually caused a re an increase in the rate of brain shrinkage. That, that, that's your choice, really. Crazy, crazy. It, uh, it, yeah. I mean, it blows my mind, but it doesn't surprise me anymore. You know, if I'd been having this conversation before the COVID era, I think I would have balked at the idea that this was happening. But now, it's just it 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 doesn't surprise me anymore when i hear stories of you know natural therapies nutritional therapies that could actually prevent or treat major illnesses you know increase the quality of our life reduce our risks of of uh mortality etc but but now you know it's 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 just so commonplace that we see this suppression of of, of such insights i mean what what kind of uh pushback have you had against your own work on this because you know surely there's a you know it, 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 you're seen as a threat to the pharmaceutical industry in some way mm. well i don't know i kind of worked something out um which is that it's really really good news <laughs> that and i i love the title of your conference the people's reset because after a lot of, uh, uh, you know, failed attempts, really, we realized that it's really impossible to change the status quo. Uh, in other words, we say, why aren't, why isn't my doctor telling me? Why isn't prevention in the National Health Service? Why are the government not funding, you know, prevention, which they don't? Why are the charities like Alzheimer's Society and Hey, are you gay? Why do they actually not, you know, paying attention to any of this? Really, homocysteine, B vitamins, omegas, et cetera, et cetera, and sugar. So I realized that what we had to do, and we actually did this back, you know, more than 10 years ago, was we got permission to digitize that validated cognitive function test. And we started to test people. And we will end this year, and it's free. So you go to foodforthebrain.org, take the test, it's free. Yesterday, 100 people did it, roughly 100 every day are doing it. 
We will end this year with about 450,000 tests having been run. We are launching in China and Japan in November um, to a group of about 20 million people. Uh, we hope by the end of next year to have tested a million people. This will make us the biggest research database in the world, and it's all charitable. And after you've done the actual test, which is not a questionnaire, you then fill in a questionnaire on things like smoking, antioxidants, sugar intake, exercise, everything that we know is a risk factor. It then works out your dementia risk index. You want it to be zero. So if you score 100%, you have a very high chance in the future of losing your mind. If you score 0%, you have no chance. And we then tell you exactly what is driving your risk and the hardest hitting simple changes that you need to make to reduce that risk. And then we track you and you've become a citizen scientist, right? This is, you've become a citizen scientist. And uh, we grew tenfold last year and we're growing and growing and growing. It's all charitable. Um, and, you know, we hope to reach millions. In other words, you don't need the NHS or the doctor or the government or the system involved. We are going direct to people. And what's happened, and this has been amazing to watch, is that these brilliant scientists like Professor David Smith and many others um, who have spent a lifetime of work as good humanitarians doing research, believing that if they do really good quality research and they get published in the top journals, which they all have, that it will change the system. And largely it's changed nothing. Mm -hmm. So they end up really disappointed. And they've joined us. I mean, from all over the world, the leading, leading guy in China, America, this university, Harvard, um, you know, University of California, I mean, the, the whole lot. Uh, so we now have a team and we've set up the Alzheimer's Prevention Expert Group, about 16 world-class professors who absolutely know that this is a preventable thing. And we can apply the very same principles, by the way, to other conditions. I mean, sort of shockingly, uh, this, this weekend we publish the results where well, they came out in a, in, a, in a journal that people wouldn't have written. Two children, uh, they're actually twins, but, but not identical, um, dizygotic twins, both diagnosed with autism, severe autism, and there's a scale of autism, and now neither have autism. Wow. There, it's gone. And, uh, you know, there are no signs. We can't say, but the odds are it won't come back. It's been absolutely clearly uh, delineated, measured, recorded, et cetera, et cetera, by changing, changing their diet, some supplements, lifestyle changes, and so on, structure, function, utilization. So what's happening, we've, we're normalizing dementia. You know, it's just what's going to happen. And we are normalizing um, neurodivergence. So let's be clear here. We are all neurodiverse. Yes, yes. The word neurodivergence refers to the outliers who are extremely neurodiverse or more so. And if you look up the symptoms, for example, of autism, uh, what you see is that every one of the common signs and symptoms of autism has research showing that something, whether it's less sugar or more omega-3s or vitamin A or whatever, reduces it. So I, I don't want to create the impression that I think that all autism is reversible or it's a very broad term anyway. Yes, yeah, but, I agree. Yeah. But our view is, is if anyone is suffering, a child or an adult with anxiety or insomnia or gut problems or depression or inability to concentrate or inability to socialize, in other words, something is happening that makes them unhappy. And if there's something that we know that might help them, well, let's try. And in the case of these, these two twins, um, the results have led to them no longer being classifiable as autistic. That's incredible. What about things like ADHD? I mean, would you consider ADHD a form of neurodivergence? Definitely. And yeah. do, you think, do you think it's possible for, you know, I, 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 yeah. I, was, I was listening to an interview with uh, Andrew Huberman and my wife and I were listening to it and he was talking through the symptoms of ADHD and she said, yep, 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 that's you, Dan. Uh, 
I, I, in my childhood, I, I would say I didn't dis- demonstrate any signs of ADHD or no one picked up on it at least. Do you believe it's possible to have adult onset ADHD? And, uh, you know, I, I have started to read into this factor and it does seem that there is an increasing, uh, in the same way that our knowledge of neuroplasticity is increasing, it, there, there is some sort of acknowledgement that ADHD um, could be a late onset through our behaviors or deficiencies. Well, yeah, definitely. And there's a lot that we can do in that context, but I, I don't quite, it's this, you know, the, 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 the diagnosing in that way. I mean, a little bit like now, I mean, diagnosing myself off a podcast is probably not the, the best way to do well, things. <laughs> I want to give you two examples and then, and then sort of dive into ADHD, which definitely is neurodivergence and definitely can be helped in many, many cases. But nowadays, because dementia is so prevalent, anyone who like, you know, can't find their keys, like, oh, I'm getting dementia, you know, so we've started to use the, the word, um, you know, in, in a very broad context. Um, many years ago, depression um, could, well, depression, you can only prescribe one drug for depression, which is an antidepressant. And then uh, what happened was uh, the schizophrenia drugs got um, re classified as mood stabilizers. And then suddenly, um, the, the number of people who were diagnosed with bipolar, which used to be called manic depression, there is a real manic depression syndrome, no question, but the number with bipolar went way up. Um, because if you're bipolar, as opposed to depression, as your diagnosis, now you can prescribe both a mood stabilizer and an antidepressant. So you've doubled your market. Now, you know, I, I work hard and I've written lots of books and, and, you know, so if I went to the doctor, maybe a bit burnt out, because that, you know, that can happen if you're in the zone, you know, um, in the flow for too long. I learned and I'm still learning really that when you've been in the flow for a period of time, you then have to have a period of deep recovery. Yeah. And us kind of workaholics who get in the flow and then don't yes. have that period of end up a bit depressed. Yes, know that feeling. Yeah, being in that cycle. Yeah. And then you go to the doctor, oh, I'm a bit depressed. And they say, well, what happens when you're not depressed? I said, well, I've written 48 books. <laughs> I get up in the morning they go, oh, well, they are definitely bipolar, right? Mm. So the issue really is uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder is what ADHD is. And um, if you get bored easily and, um, you know, you you just like to learn a lot of things and you're generally quite high energy and hyperactive. It, it doesn't mean you've got a disorder. I agree. Yeah. Thing. Because this is where it gets yeah. really interesting because you know, the patterns are very, you know, if, if you do Myers Briggs, I'm an ENTP. If you do Roger Hamilton's kind of talent dynamics or wealth dynamics, I'm a creator and you, you read the actual traits of these character types. And again, the generalizations, but they're basically the same. You know, you, you're re- relentlessly curious, very creative, you know, divergent yeah. thinking, you know, uh, general restlessness. I, I mean, I'm a Scorpio and even those characteristics come up in a school, you know, so it's, I, I don't want a label oh. or need a label, but it, but it does help me understand the things I can then do to stabilize some of those things. And, and interestingly, o- Omega-3 has been one of those actually yeah. that's, that's helps with well, my focus. The label is very, very useful for prescribing drugs. Well, yes. And I'm not interested in being prescribed drugs. <laughs> I mean, actually, like the, the most common test, which we use as well in research for depression, it's called Hamilton Rating Scale of Depression. You fill out the questionnaire and you answer certain questions. And then if you're a clinician, it says on the back, if you've if you've answered yes to this, 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 prescribe this, 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 prescribe this, 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 prescribe this. So what we're doing, and it's kind of fascinating, is taking um, in depression a condition that is, um, you know, we're taking psychological symptoms, filling in a questionnaire, and then prescribing a chemical, right? Um, so, you know, it's kind of a strange thing. You go, well, if it's actually a chemical imbalance, because that was the pitch, that these antidepressants, you're de- deficient in serotonin, you need the antidepressant. But why don't you run a test? You know, if it's a chemical imbalance, why don't you run a chemical test? So I'm much less interested in these titles and much more interested in the person and what the problem is. So I'll give you an example. I was called in some years ago by the BBC and they said, can you change uh, children's learning and behavior in, in a week? And I said, well, probably. So what they did was they dumped me in a class of 30 kids, um, average age seven. And I said to the teacher, how many of these children are having um, 
behavior or learning problems. Can't sit still, can't read, can't write, you know, whatever. And they instantly said 10 of them. And today that could be, you know, you know that was 30% or a third. They could say half. But in most classes, at least a third are having problems. That means that they can't learn. So they, they can't keep their attention. They're hyperactive and they're struggling reading, writing, and so on. So I took those 10 kids, or rather the parents of those 10 kids. And um, by the way, I had the, I had the teacher do a test the day before we started where the kids had to write a story. And, um, and then the same again in one week's time without them knowing it was anything to do with this. And I said to those parents, just for one week, I'm going to give you a drink. I'll give your child a drink, which has got extra vitamins and minerals, essential fats in them. And I would like you to give them no sugar. Well, that's a big ask, but if you can give them nothing with sugar. And, uh, I want you to give more fish if possible, less meat and nothing, no colorings or, you know, just no food that has MSG or this or that, whatever. Lots of fruit and veg, nuts, you know, et cetera. And of course, some did it, some didn't, you know, to varying extent. Now, the worst child in the school is called Reese, um, who was, you know, literally the worst in the class. He went up one year in reading and writing age in one month. Wow. And he went from bottom of the class to almost top of the class. And his teacher said he can now sit and concentrate and he loves learning and so on. So sometimes, not always, you have a child who may be called ADHD, or whatever. They're actually, they've got a hyperactive mind because they're bright. Mm. But what they don't have, possibly because they're lacking a nutrient like omega-3 or eating too much sugar, is that the brain is not working. So just to unpack that a little bit. If you have too much sugar, I mean, the funny thing is for 40 years, we've been campaigning to eat whole foods. You know, if you can pick it out of the ground off a tree, it's good. Now it's called, you know, and, and don't have the refined white stuff is what we've been saying. Now it's all become sexy again because it's called ultra processed foods. Don't eat ultra processed foods. We've been saying that for 40 years. So if, if a child has a big input of sugar and to put it in context in your bloodstream, you've got in your entire bloodstream of thousands and thousands of arteries, you've got three teaspoons of glucose. That's it. If you have a can of Coke, which is 10, um, you, you can become hyperactive. So rule number one, stabilize blood sugar. Um, Omega-3s, we know, stabilize mood. Um, they don't increase IQ in the same way multivitamins have consistently at the right dose has increased IQ. Um, but the omega threes stabilize mood. So, typical example: people don't think of this. They have a young child, two, three, four, five, six, seven, who has sort of temper tantrums, or they just fly off the handle and go into a rage, and they can't be controlled, and they burst into tears, and they've lost all emotional stability. The odds are they're omega three deficient. As simple as that, because you cannot control your moods without omega three. So, and by the way, omega-3 means marine food or supplements. Now, yeah, Zach's getting fish for dinner. He's going for a bit of a phase at the minute, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but you know, there is no recommended intake of omega-3. Yeah. Um, the government's recommendation is to have two seafood a, a week. Less than 5% of children achieve this. And I'm sure anyone listening can think of a child whether it's theirs or someone else's, who eats no fish at all, has no omega-3 supplements, and therefore has no source of omegas. So if you lack B vitamins and you lack omegas and you eat too much sugar, I would be really surprised if you weren't ADHD. Yeah. I mean, for kids that, I mean, oh gosh, you know, try, try, trying to gently persuade <laughs> a child to take on certain strong flavors is, is can be difficult. Have you, have you come across a type of fish? Because again, what tends to happen is, you know, and we, 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 we try, try to avoid this at all costs is you get the ultra processed versions. It's like the, you know, battered yeah. random, like probably fish waste that's left over from, <laughs> from a, from a factory somewhere. 
Yeah, have you have you found that there is particular types of fish that children well, tend to gravitate towards, or, or even supplements that are suitable yeah. for young children? Well, yeah, and just to sort of broaden that out, having now moving up to half a million adults doing this online cognitive function test, um, we are now building, and we need money for this, by the way, if anybody can help in any way, cognition for smart kids and teens. So we're applying all our learning, and we hope very, very early, maybe in January or February of 2025, we will launch that campaign. So any child with their parent can do the tests, or any teen on their own can do the thing. So there's a few. Um, so that's amazing. That's what we want to focus on. The um, some of it is context. I remember we were running um, um, things in schools, events. And I would teach, you know, in primary school, secondary school, primary school, ask a question like, what's your brain made of? And somebody would say, bogeys, you know, whatever it happened to be, you know. So, you know, you have to explain that the brain is two thirds fat, right? And the, the main fat that builds a brain, you know, is from fish and so on, you know. So there's a story behind it. And we had a table where um, there was a... A vegetable of every color, you know, green, yellow, orange, red, purple, blue. And uh, the, the name of the game was if you eat, and they're all raw, you know, we'd have a raw pea and a you know, raw carrot and a, whatever it is. And the name of the game is if you ate every color raw, then you get the rainbow sticker. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we're working in difficult schools here. And the parents said to me, well, you know, there's absolutely no way you are going to get that child to eat a raw vegetable. And we had about a 98% success rate. And the other day I was with my, my grandson and he's been a little bit vegetable of us, um, but that's changed. And one of the things we did, we got broad beans. Well, I had a whole thing on broad beans. And you can make a really nice nose with the skin of broad beans. So we started playing with food, you know, and doing things with it and, and then make a pizza with the vegetables and so on. So we wrote a book called Smart Food for Smart Kids, where every recipe in it had to be made and approved by kids. And we were working in yeah, the good. worst SAT scoring school in the UK. So when you, you know, start to tell the story, which might be a little bit harder for a two year old, but it's not actually. I mean, the, you know, the younger these impressions go in, then introducing new flavors very, very gradually. So if a child eats a tomato sauce on pasta, put a little bit of tuna, whatever it is in it, salmon or whatever it is. And I know we can talk about farm salmon and tin tuna and all that sort of stuff. But just, you know, getting used to these flavors and associating these foods with something that's going to make you brainy and good and this and that and whatever and having fun with it. And you can get through. And um, but it isn't, you know, I, I, I get it. It's difficult. Same thing with. With sugar. I mean, I may get arrested for this, but I'll tell you a funny <laughs> I had the other day, but I was in charge of my lovely grandson, and this particular one is, is a sugar addict. And I notice he's literally climbing up the kitchen, you know, cupboard, because in the very top, for some reason, he knew there was some chocolate biscuits, whatever it happened to be. And I said, I said, no, uh, you've had enough sugar, you know, don't have any more. And uh, he said, why not? Uh, and uh, he said, I like it. And I said, well, that's completely logical. You know, you like it, you want it, I get it, I understand that. But there is a reason why I'm saying no more. Um, because there is a disease and it's called diabetes. And you won't get it now, but if you eat a load of sugar, you get it in the future. And he said, what's diabetes? Uh, I says, well, let's Google it. You know, so we went online and uh, there were 260,000 amputations Oh, gosh. Um, you know, over this last year um, for diabetes. Nothing like a bit uh, of fear to uh, <laughs> change behavior. Yeah. And I said, well, oh, <laughs> they chop your leg off. And he said, well, how do they do it? I said, they do it with a saw. <laughs> and he said, does it come back? I said, no, it's gone. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's a limit you know, on, on the amount of sugar, you know. They said, well, my dad, he eats Haribo's and drinks Coke. And, uh, you know, will he get diabetes? I said, well, you know, it's possible. I mean, you know, th there is a reason for these things. But let's let's have some fun and make some food. So, you know, then you get, so then we made 
um, pancakes. And by the way, I'll tell you this now because it's very delicious. You get oat flour. And how do you make oat flour in your now redundant, your coffee grinder, right? You put the oat flakes in, you grind it up. Actually, a little bit of coffee in there is nice too. The flavor is good. A little bit of cardamom, a little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of um, sodium bicarb, an egg, uh, some milk. I happen to have no dairy products, so I use a bit of oat milk or plant milk of some sort. Uh, amazing pancake mix, right? And, uh, you know, my grandson is doing this with me. You know, and he really, can you crack an egg? You know, he's enjoying this whole process. And then we get some blueberries, you know, yogurt or whatever it is you wish to do. And uh, maple syrup, of course, is sugar and it's very, very tasty. And I've just discovered there's a chicory root, um, inulin, chicory root um, syrup. It's very, very tasty. No, no sugar effect. So there are things you can do. And, um, you know, and some nuts, maybe pecans. And now he's involved, right? Yeah. And and so in the right culture and the right stories, and of course you have to be doing the things that you want them to do, the thing starts to happen. But the real worry we have is, you know, these children, they are our future. And Professor Michael Crawford, who's one of the geniuses in this area, who showed that you can actually measure in the bloodstream of a woman who becomes pregnant, omega-3. But what happens is if, they're, if they have insufficient omega-3 to build their baby's brain, they produce a surrogate oil. It's a type of oleic oil, which oleic acid, which is what's in olive oil, which is used in the fetus as a packer to build the brain but it doesn't work. And from measuring that level of oleic acid in the blood, you can tell which child is going to be born with neurodevelopmental problems. Wow. It's, it's that linear. And the terrible thing is not all of this is reversible. Gosh. Uh, and this is, by the way, in case you hadn't heard it, we know that the mother's brain will shrink to feed the baby's, the fetus's brain. It's that important an evolutionary imperative. If a woman has insufficient omega-3s, phospholipids, um, their baby will rob their brain. Mummy, I shrank your brain. <laughs> That's <laughs> Wow. Well, on that bombshell, uh, we're coming up to a, a, a close to the end of our session. Um, you obviously mentioned the citizen science, which is something we're very excited to share at the Pe People's Reset. Uh, you'll be featuring sharing a fantastic talk. Give us the title of your talk uh, at the People's Reset. It's the four horsemen of the mental health apocalypse because there are four biological drivers. We've touched on them a bit on the sugar, on the omega-3, but there are four things that are totally under your control that lie behind all this autism, ADHD, depression, dementia, Alzheimer's. And I would like to show you how to build a better brain. You are the master of your brain's future. You are the master of your brain's destiny. Nobody needs to lose their mind. And when you get the biology correct, never mind the lifestyle as well, your brain literally starts to sink. You wake up full of energy. Um, the neurons work, the connections happen, and that's how we should be. And uh, that's part of the people's reset. Well, I, you know, quite frankly, after this conversation, I think, you know, just, just your talk would be worth the price of admission alone because, you know, you could, you're not only able to increase your energy now, but actually help, you know, prevent brain deterioration. You know, we can actually literally, based on what you've shared, take full agency over our long-term health. And I think what this, this conversation has illuminated for me actually is when, when I think about and when other people think about that I've had conversations with and they think of health, they tend to go to the physical. They tend to talk about weight or, or, uh, or, or fitness. This conversation around brain health and, you know, particularly when we discussed the study at the beginning, the studies at the beginning that show the impact on mortality, it's, it's crazy. We have to be paying much more attention to the health of our brain. And today's conversation has been, you know, for me has really drilled that home and also, the simplicity of the solution, really, in terms of the, the, the dietary side and the supplementation. So I can't wait for your talk at the People's Reset. I'll be 
sat at the front taking notes. Well, in fact, I'll, I'll let our guests take the front seats. I'll stand on the side taking notes. Um, now, for those who want to participate in citizen-led science, you know, we've mentioned the cognitive function test. Um, I'm very excited to be doing this myself. I had I had hoped to do it before our session and kind of get a live, live reading of what, what it all means, but uh, I didn't have the chance to do it this time around. But for people who want to uh, participate in the cognitive function test and, and get their own reading, um, well, they can go foodforthebrain.org and it's, it's there on the top section. You can see it in bold. Uh, but do, can you just walk people through the process when they, when they go through that? Sure. So um, foodforthebrain.org, you go there, click on the button, take the test. You're going to have to register, which means giving a few details, your email and your age and sex and all that sort of stuff. Immediately, all your data is anonymized, and we do need it for research. So do it. And uh, when you finish the actual test, which I can't tell you too much about, it's interactive, uh, you'll then have a questionnaire to fill out. And then from that, it will show you exactly what your risk is and what's driving in the future. It would be do it before the people's reset because it'll make so much more sense. I can sort of bounce off your results in a way. If you um, don't mind or, or wish to, um, there are four tests for homocysteine, omega-3 index, um, vitamin D, and a blood sugar measure called HbA1c. And uh, we've developed a kit, a home test kit, where you prick your finger. You know, it costs 170 pounds, something like that. And you then have an actual biological measure of where you are at. To give you an example, um, if you're over 8% for omega-3 index, then you're really not going to get dementia. Uh, criminals average 2%. Wow. Uh, the UK average is 4%. So you think, oh, maybe I'm all right and so on. Uh, so you can actually get a measure if you wish. You know, that is a, and, so, and that will make the talk even more interactive because you can see exactly where you're at. So there are measurable things, you know, that you can change. And even they think, I want to do this for myself. And do you know that the tragedy is a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to know. That, that is so the wrong thing because you do want to know because you can change things. You know, it's so important to know that you can absolutely dementia-proof your diet and lifestyle. And the way to do that is to understand, you know, what's, what's pushing the button, so to speak. And so do it for yourself because it will give you a lot of benefit. Uh, but also you become a citizen scientist. So your data is helping others. Um, we fund our charity because people become friends of it and give 50 pounds a year. Uh, and there are a lot of benefits. I won't go into all those here. But it is wonderful. We have such a great team and we're spreading internationally. And, uh, you know, again, we can do what the purpose of the health service is directly to people and uh, we are using digital health technology, so we're grateful that it exists. Uh, and yeah, get involved. Food for the brain. It'd be amazing if. That. Is there a clever way that we can uh, get a unique link for the test? I'd be very fascinated to see yeah. if there was a way to get you know our cohort versus the. Is there a clever way that we can? I should have asked yeah, you it offline rather than put you on the spot, but. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, we'll make it um, foodforthebrain.org slash reset. Wow. And then exactly. yeah, we can see yeah, our and cohort versus them. It'll take us a couple of days to set that up. But everyone who does it under slash reset will then become part of that group. Wow. And as a consequence, because of GDPR and everything else, you can't see anyone's individual results. But we can see the group's results as, as if it were a person. Wow. So if you like the dementia risk index. The aggregate eight, results. Yeah. And then what will happen is you can go, hey, you reset guys, our weakest, <laughs> point, our weakest link is this. So let's do a bit of education on this. And then a few months later, you know, we can relook. Wow. So wow. that's the whole way this operates. We want to get um, basically Amazing. every domain, like B vitamins is a domain, omega-3 is a domain, sugar is a domain. Uh, you can score red, orange, yellow, or green. Wow. So if you've got eight reds, bad news. Eight greens, you're sorted. So Incredible. your community, uh, you're now helping your community to go from reds to greens. Amazing. So and we can also use that information. Can, yeah, we by can contact Monday. the chef at the hotel and say, we need this particular food now because of the results of our test. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, this is incredible. Monday, I'm so excited. Food for the brain. Amazing. Slash reset.
Perfect. So we'll, we'll take that challenge. Uh, obviously, people watching the podcast can do this as well. Let that be your additional encouragement to come and join us at the People's Reset. I do appreciate you know, all of you are listening or watching from uh, the United Kingdom, but we have got people traveling from the United States, from South America, from Europe uh, to come and join us. Uh, but we will be live streaming the event as well. So um, you'll be able to watch in full from home. But if you can join us, at the People's Reset, come and meet Patrick. I know you're going to get bombarded now with all kinds of questions uh, when you when you arrive. So um, thank you so much for our discussion today. Truly illuminating, and I thoroughly commend the work that you're doing. Uh, I cannot wait to, uh, for your session at the People's Reset, and I can't wait to do this test as well. And I'm now very curious about this uh, this um, physical test uh, that I can that I can actually test some of these levels in my in my system. So I'm very curious about doing that as well. So. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again in, in person in, in, well, just a few weeks' time now. Thank you, Dan. This is a solutions event. This is what's happening. After five successful events in North America, the Freedom Cell Network is partnering with Free Humanity to bring the People's Reset to Bath, UK. The technocrats at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum are now hosting the Summit of the Future in New York City in September 2024. Join us in September for the People's Reset UK, our summit for our future. Over three days, we will gather in community, celebrating our victories and successes, whilst continuing to highlight solutions under five holistic themes. Liberate your mind, body and spirit. Permaculture and food independence. Building parallel networks empowering technology and building free and conscious communities 24 top-notch speakers including neil oliver charles dowding dan aston gregory nigel hallett john and rebecca bush and many more we'll also be hosting the people's reset concert featuring international artist dub fx as well as presence 33 and more talented performers to come join us for the people's reset uk Visit thegreaterreset.org to learn more and to get your ticket today.